piece with us tonight. So Michael Richardson is co-founder of Rivers and Mountains Green Faith, engaged in climate action and coalition with Stop the Money Pipeline, Third Act, Green Faith International, and New York Renews and the Midden Upper Hudson Valley of New York State. He's a lifelong activist for more resistance and social justice movements beginning in the early 1970s to today as a planner and organizer of climate and environmental actions. Michael is also an advocate for regenerative agriculture. In 2012, he co-founded and directed an agroecology training and demonstration center in Nicaragua for small scale growers. That sounds like another program to me. From a varied cache of experiences, including organic farmer, solar installer, labor economist, county legislator, and Buddhist practitioner, Michael is committed to bringing attention to the moral imperative to stop funding climate chaos. Michael? Well, thank you for hosting this workshop. Uh, we're going to get off to a quick stop, start and move right along. This webinar is designed for 90 minutes, but we can condense it down. It basically becomes a summary of the workshop. Our objective is to show you a web page that we've put together that you can use at home, particularly this time of year when the, when the nights are long and the days are cold. Uh, you'll find this as a uh, good alternative to a pinochle game. So what I'd like to do is right away start with the screen share, because again, the workshop is based on this web page that you can use at home. So here we go with the screen share. And where we start is on our website. I just put into the chat the uh, web address. It's rivers-mountains-greenfaith.org. And that will bring you to our homepage here. And certainly we welcome you to take a little tour around the uh, mid and upper Hudson Valley, uh, a little bit about who we are, uh, our origins, and some beautiful pictures of the rivers and mountains that we take our name from. What we offer you then is to come up here to the top of the homepage and click on individual divestment. And this will bring you to a landing page. Uh, here is our calendar workshop. And you can see down here, we have the Bethlehem Food Co-op. But here you will go to go to workshop. Now, as you see here from the beginning, that this is uh, a workshop to align your money with your values. And it shows how individuals, as well as organizations, can move their finances from Funding Fossil Fuel Extraction, Production, and Distribution. Now, right there is the most curious thing to me. That is about moving my finances from funding fossil fuel extraction, production, and distribution. Well, how the heck did I get involved in that in the first place? I don't remember ever making a conscious decision to have my money being used for these things. I mean, imagine this, that Mr. Peabody, Mr. Peabody's coal trains, Mr. Peabody, he comes to me and he says, Michael, uh, I have this uh, mountain in Pennsylvania that I want to take the top off of to get to some coal. Loan me some money. I'd say, Mr. Peabody, I don't think so. That just really doesn't align with my values. And Mr. Peabody, he just shrugs his shoulders, doesn't say much, walks on down the street to my bank walks into my bank and said, hey, loan me some of Michael's money. I have a mountaintop I want to take off to get to some coal. And bank says, sure, no problem. They write up a piece of paper. And suddenly, I am involved in my money financing fossil fuel extraction. So let's get into this a little bit. What you have to do here from the landing page is click to go to workshop. And you'll see here the entire workshop laid out for you. Personal banking, we'll spend a few minutes there first. Then we'll go on to credit cards. Then we scroll down here a little bit more to home and auto insurance. How do we know, get a load of this, my home and auto insurance too is involved in fossil fuel production and extraction. And then we get down to retirement investments. 
This is our most meaty section, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time over here on this search engine here as you so. Let's go back up to the top. We start with banks because banks are rather basic. And let's just simply say that if you bank with any of these major Wall Street banks here, your money is being used to fund climate destruction. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how that gets done because we want to spend our time on how do you find alternatives to move your money away from these things. So we'd like to give you some resources to do your own research. Uh, if, if, if you've ever done this before by going online, there's an immense amount of material out there. And I must say that it becomes quite overwhelming. And uh, it, it gets to the point where it's just so much you don't know how to sort through it. Some of the material is repetitious. Some of the material is not so accurate. Some of it is even wrong. So we've tried to give you four or five uh, sources where you can go read all about it. So as far as uh, getting a better bank, we recommend that you go to our friends at Green America and look up what they have to say about that. Uh, here's a little helpful tool. Most of us have plenty of experience moving our money from one institution to another, but Stop the Money Pipeline, which we're a coalition member of, they have some steps for moving your money. But what we wanna do over here is take a look at where to go. So if you have a situation where you want to leave one of these Wall Street banks because they are using your money, they're loaning your money for the purposes of fossil fuel projects, uh, it's rather simple that you just leave the Wall Street bank and go to a community bank or a community credit union. Now, um, just a comment here about the Wall Street banks. Wall Street banks exist for the purposes of meeting the financial needs, the banking services of Wall Street companies. So when a major Wall Street company needs to have financial services or to have loans or to move money around, they go to the Wall Street banks because quite candidly, the small banks can't meet their needs. They don't have the complex international services. Now, there's few of us, I would say none of us, that really need these Wall Street banks. But we've been doing business with them for quite a while simply because they are household names in some cases. Uh, or we got a credit card through them, or we took a student loan through them, or we got a mortgage through them. But otherwise, there's no real need for us to be with them. So without being too simplistic, if you want to get away from the Wall Street banks, well, just let your feet do the walking and go over to a community bank or a credit union. Community banks fall into two different categories. There are the large regional commu uh, community banks. Uh, few, if any of them, put any monies into fossil fuel projects. And then, of course, there's the smaller community bank, which is much like the credit union, where you can be fairly assured that none of the money is going into fossil fuels. But let's take a quick look at this Mighty Deposits. You can also take a look at Bank Green and Bank for Good, but let's use Mighty Deposits. This is put together by a women's collaborative. It's a not-for-profit. All of the data is non-proprietary. It's received through state and federal banking and regulatory agencies. So to get to use to this, scroll down, take a look. And when the, these nights are long and the days are cold, you got plenty of time to do this. But we would go up here and we would find a bank, or if you're looking for a credit union, you need to jump over here to find a credit union. So if you go looking for a credit union here, you won't find it. Same thing for banks over here. Let's start with banks. Now, if my sister Molly was going to move to Wichita, she might want to do, I want a bank located in Wichita. That is... The anything we're going to leave here, um, these are some added values, if you will. So beyond just looking for being fossil free, we may want to find a bank that is excelling in one of these categories. We call these the good guy buttons. You'll see more about them here in a moment, but let's just leave it here at anything. So you type in Wichita anything and you get a whole list of banks. But instead, let's look up a bank by name. And I'm just going to start here with one of the Wall Street banks, and then I'm going to ask one of you to give me a bank 
there in the Bethlehem Allentown area. So here, let's just start. Let's pick on Chase tonight. They're a good bank to pick on. And here is their main bank in Columbus, Ohio. And we do click. And you'll see here right away that it has a bad guy button. Top funder of fossil fuels. And to note later, there are no good guy buttons. They would be here. But they have a bad guy button, top funder of fossil fuels. And you'll see that if you had $100 in deposit, only $19, 19% would be going back into the community investments. And this is basically what you'd expect from a Wall Street bank, because they don't exist for the purposes of loaning money in the community. They exist for the purposes of loaning money to Wall Street ventures. If you were to click here on more data, you'd find out more about them. Loading data. Here we go. And you can see that they're below industry average on all of these categories, again, because they're loaning money out to Wall Street ventures. But let's back off here a bit and go back in. And can somebody give me a bank of their choosing? Just shout it out. How about Embassy Bank? Embassy? Correct. E-M-B-A-S-S-Y. Okay, uh, we're seeing this one, for, I assume this one from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? Correct. Okay, here we go. Well, this looks pretty good to me. You see here in contrast, $72 of investment for every 100 you deposit, that's 93% above industry average. We like seeing numbers between the upper 60s all the way up to 80. Now, not more than 80, because they better be holding back a little bit of money for, um, uh, everybody remembers that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart loans out all of his money and then there's a run on the bank. You don't want to be in that situation. You can see that it's very much a community bank because they don't have any money loaned outside the base in Pennsylvania. And look at these good guy buttons here. If you want to see more about those good guy buttons, click here. And you can see where in housing, they're very heavy. And that's where you would like to see. So we started out this conversation by talking about moving your money out of fossil fuels. Can we refer to that as not having your money do harm? And we at least want to see that our money is doing no harm. But wouldn't it be nice that we could also see our money being used for good? Now, because we give our money to banks in an unconditional way, uh, why do we use banks? Uh, well, for me, I use it because I want convenience and I want security. So the convenience is there. They give me a debit card and a checkbook. And the security is there because they'll even insure me up to a quarter million dollars of deposits. But otherwise, um, I have no transactional commitment from them. I give them my money and I don't tell them how they can or can't use it. That's why Mr. Peabody was able to walk down the street and just say, hey, give me some of Michael's money in the loan, and, and, and they can do that. So how do I make certain that my money's not being used for harm? Well, I don't have a contract. If I go to a community bank or even a credit union, I still don't have a contract with them telling them how to use the money, but I can come here to Mighty Deposits and see if they're putting back into my community. So here with this embassy bank, I see that a good number of my deposits are very likely going to be used for housing. That's do good. Or maybe it's being used to fund out some of these businesses here. That's do good. It's not being used for fossil fuel extraction. So I don't want to spend any more time here on the banks. We'll open this up with some questions. But just be aware that you can go in and you can look for your credit unions. And you can look for your banks. And if you are looking around just in general, you can go click down here to these other guides. For example, eco-friendly banks. Well, look at this, browse banks not financing fossil fuels. Well, this is a fossil fuel free workshop. So let's click on that for a moment. And you can see they give us a list of banks that they like and look at all these good guy buttons over here. So they're up in the 60s, 70s and 80s as far as community investments. They have all these wonderful good guy buttons, including these sustainable B Corps. 
Uh, I recommend that you jot down to do some home research in your search engine on what a B Corp is. Michael, can yes. I, I just interrupt? Our first session last year was on B Corps. So we have that. We can provide that link to last year's video for everyone. So it'll be a quick yeah. overview for everyone. Thanks that's, for plugging that. Well, that's good news because I tell you, in our household, we go to the B Corp website when we're buying detergents and linens. Uh, we use that as our clean. Again, I have uh, so little time to go do all my research these days that it's nice to have somebody like B Corp that's vetting these companies for me. Right. Just to note here, the Spring Bank is one of the greenest banks in the country. Beneficial State Bank is very high there too, even though they do have some low community investment uh, mark there. And then, of course, there's uh, um, uh, many other good banks here for you to look at. And these are not the only ones. These are just 13 that popped out in that little search that I did. So let's move on now. Sorry, I can't spend more time, but with a condensed version, we have to move along to credit cards. Now, this is a little bit different than what we were talking about when we have a bank deposit that is being uh, unconditionally loaned out. Um, here, it's no longer our money. Once we make a transaction, we have the good or service that we purchased, but we put our money into play. And by using a credit card, there are three things that we do that move off to funding Chase, City, Wells Fargo, Capital One, or any of those. And what the three categories are is one, a annual user fee. Now, hopefully most of us have credit cards that don't have annual fees. The other one is the interest that you pay on any debt. Hopefully none of us have any credit card debt, that if we have debt that we've structured that through a bank or a credit union. The other is what we call the transaction fee. And I'm gonna use the number 3%. It could be 1%, it could be 5%, but I think most of you are aware that if I use a credit card to say buy a $100 product from a, a vendor, that vendor is only gonna get 97 of those $100. The other $3 goes back to the bank that issued the card. Now I just used a term there, issued the card. There are two things that we're gonna talk about here, branding and issuing. What I mean by that is, let's take a quick look here at the Evergreen card. This is brand. This is a card from First National Bank of Omaha, FNBO. So First National Bank of Omaha is the bank that is branding and issuing this card. I could have had here a city card or a Bank of America card, like a, a Sapphire card, that is branded and issued by Citibank. So in that particular case, that 3%, um, they may be giving me 2% cash back or 1.5% cash back. And then that bank that is issuing the card is going to get the other 1.5%. Some of that 1.5% is for profit. Some of that is for covering bad debt. Uh, another bank that brands and issues their own card is the Beneficial State Bank out on the West Coast. They brand this climate card. Now, there are institutions and banks that do not issue their own card. One very popular card, in fact, I have this card, is the Amalgamated Bank card. They don't issue it. They just brand it. I'm going to jump over here and look at an affinity card that comes from Green America. Of course, Green America is not a bank, so they don't issue their own card, but this is their brand, and they have their card issued by an institution called TCM. You see TCM up here? TCM is not a brick and mortar bank. It is a bank that exists solely for the purposes of issuing cards for other banks and organizations. So First National Bank of Omaha, Beneficial State Bank, these are brick and mortar banks that are fossil free, that are issuing their own card and also other organizations cards. Same thing for TCM. Credit unions have something just like TCM. It's called CUNA. So CUNA is for credit unions, TCM is for banks and, and not-for-profits, same thing for these two. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about store cards and affinity cards in a minute, but um, let's go over and use this as an example again. So let's say on my amalgamated bank card, that 3% that's in play, 
a half a percent is going to go to amalgamated bank because they're branding the card. That's what they get out of it. I'm going to get one and a half percent cash back, leaving one percent that's going to go to First National Bank of Omaha. Same thing up here where a way to give a donation to Green America or to Sierra Club is you get their card. And every time you use the card, a half a percent is going to go to support Green America or half a percent would go to support Sierra Club. I would get anywhere from one to one and a half percent back in points or cash back, leaving one or one and a half percent to go to, in this case, TCM, in this case, Beneficial State Bank, because they're the ones that are issuing the card. Now, how do you know what's going on? First of all, um, if the card is being branded by another institution, another bank, it's going to say so on the bank back. So if I turn my amalgamated back bank card over, it's going to say that it's issued by FNBO. Now, what if I turn my card over and it says nothing? Uh, now, maybe it's from a community bank and it says nothing, or a credit union, and it says nothing. That means they're issuing their own card. So I don't know if any of you have your credit card handy, but you might want to take a look at it and see who's branding it and who's issuing it. Now, again, if it's being branded and issued by the same bank, it's probably not going to say anything on the back. Now, the other way to tell is who do you write your check to at the end of every month? You're not writing your check to the branding bank. You're writing your check to the issuing bank. Now, again, I'm rushing right along here. Please allow me in this short time that we have. I do want to go back to talking about affinity cards um, and store cards. Store cards are a little bit different from these affinity cards and that they are just for use with that particular store. So Lowe's, Verizon, Sam Clubs and the like. Amazon does have a card that's issued by Citibank, but they also have a store card that's issued by either Synchrony or Comidity. So if any of you have a store card, you might turn it over and see these one of these two words. Synchrony and Comidity are both just like TCM. They're not brick and mortar banks. They exist for the sole purposes of issuing store cards. So TCM, sole purpose of issuing credit cards for banks or other institutions, Comidity and Synchrony are, exist for the purpose of issuing these store cards. Both of them are fossil free. So if you have a Sam's Club card that's issued by Comidity, you're not contributing to the fossil industry. Now, let's just go back for a moment and talk about the magnitude of all this. Uh, when I'm only talking about 1%, again, we're not going to talk about the um, annual fee. That would add up to billions of dollars. We're not going to talk about the uh, interest rates that are charged on debt. That adds up to trillions of dollars. We're talking about 1%. Now, why would I be at all concerned about 1% when I have so many other things to be concerned about when it comes to the financial relationship with fossil fuels? But there's an old saying that 1% of a little is a little, 1% of a lot is a lot. So the billions of dollars that are being used every day in transactions, I mean, just imagine the amount of money that's passing through credit cards every day, and these banks are getting 1% of it. It is a lot of money. But then there's another factor about it. It's a matter of that when we consume, we use our credit cards, and by doing so, we cause a chain reaction to happen with our money. It's no longer our money. We've spent it. We got what we bought. But you've allowed a certain amount of that to go off into, if you don't mind me saying, doing harm. So how do I get it so that I, my money's not going to be used to go out and invest in fossil fuel products through projects through these big banks? Well, the way I do it is by not using them. I go to an alternative, and here we've laid out to you what those alternatives are. Now, I did skip over American Express. American Express does not have the same model that these Wall Street banks do. There is nothing in an American Express transaction that involves the fossil fuel industry. 
So if you wanted to use the word American Express cards are fossil free, that's you could say that. Uh, they make their money on a different business model. They make money on processing and transacting money. They don't take their profits and go out then and invest like these banks do in fossil fuel projects. So I'm going to take a little bit of a pause here before we get into the home and auto insurance. And uh, again, we're at 7.30, so we have a half hour late. Questions on banks and credit cards. You can just come off moot and ask the question. Kathy, I see your lips moving, but I don't hear you. Ah, oh, thank you. I was saying we can't get off mute because we were all muted by, um, uh, by Matt. Uh, no, so I didn't have anything particular to say, but I figured every but because I am doing a lot of this. Um, I will say that um, I do have a, a TCM credit card and uh, I was donating to the Sierra Club every year and they had an offer for one where the extra percentage goes back as a donation to the Sierra Club every time I make a purchase. So I really like that, that one. Um, but I have another one from my bank, which is not one of those really bad ones, but it's PNC. And um, I am going to switch that because if you go on to Mighty Deposits, my PNC hardly reinvests anything to our whatever local communities that they're in. So I, I really don't like that at all. So um, yeah, I think you'd also find that PNC is a major investor in quite a few fossil fuel projects out in Western I'm Pennsylvania. Sure, they are. <laughs> So yeah, so I'm working on that. Although I I did switch to I do have a credit union now. So, um, but I haven't closed PNC. So it's it's not sometimes not as easy because of the direct deposits and it takes a lot it takes a lot longer to switch banks than it used to, you know. So, um, but I'm working on it. So. Any other quick questions before we get into this home and auto insurance? You know, I, I'm going to give a big plug for credit unions. Now here in my community, I use a community bank. It's a very small community bank. Um, I know where they're loaning the money. It's into my friends and neighbors and farms and businesses. Um, Rivers and Mountains has a very small uh, checking account to cover our demonstration expenses. And that's with a credit union. Uh, I would use a credit union myself, but we just don't have a local credit union here. Our credit unions are both from out of the area. The big plug for credit unions because of another added value, they're democratic. As the depositor, you own your credit union. Kind of like a co-op. Who am I talking to? <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Uh, speaking of co-ops, let's take a look at home and auto insurance. Now, I thought in the beginning that I was getting my home and auto insurance from a home and auto insurance company. Little did I know, and I'm not being glib here, that I'm getting my home and auto insurance, I was, from a fossil fuel insurance company. And the reality of it is, is just like Wall Street banks provide services for Wall Street companies, Wall Street insurance companies provide insurance to those same companies. So when ExxonMobil is looking to build a new refinery, even with all the profits they've had lately and all the working capital they have available to them, they rarely put that money into a new expansion project, whether it be a pipeline, a refinery, whatever. They go out to the financial markets and they obtain money either through loans from banks, or investments from asset managers, private equity, and in some case, investment banks. Or in some cases, they may be getting subsidies from state and federal governments. So they go looking for money. And none of them, the banks, the asset managers, the private equity holders, or the government will give them a penny unless they're insuring their project. And the reason for that, and you know this, 
is that fossil fuel projects are very risk intense. Think BP oil platform, Exxon Valdez, Peruvian pipeline, or most recently that pipeline that ruptured in Kansas. When it goes bad, it goes bad in a big way. So they insist, and this is where we say as activists, that one of the ways to stop the money pipeline is if we can cut off their insurance, they're not gonna be able to get the money to go out and do new projects. And again, this is what we're stressing. We're going after new fossil fuel projects. We cannot allow more fossil fuels to be put into the atmosphere. So again, what does a major insurance company do? They insure things. They insure hospitals, that's good. They insure uh, public works, that's good. But they also insure fossil fuels. And these major companies that are on this list right here are the major insurers, and even more alarming, they're also investors in fossil fuel. So when I pay my premium, and this is the way I always thought it worked, is Kathy, you pay your premium. Matthew, you pay your premium. I pay my premium. And then when Lynn has a car accident, it pays her claim. And it does work that way. But also, it is a huge amount of money. Just think of it. If you drive a car, you have to have at least liability insurance. If it's a relatively new car, you have to have collision insurance. If you have a home, you can't get a mortgage without insurance. And even if you paid off your mortgage, you best have some insurance against the loss of your home. So there are millions upon millions of people in the United States that have to have this insurance. You don't have to have a bank account. You don't have to have a credit card, but you have to have insurance. And that's the reason that if you go on television at night, night after night, you'll see these commercials from the, the lizard, Geico, or the Enu with his head in the sand, Liberty Mutual, or Flo, they're having a little skit on Progressive. Now, you notice that they don't say anything about their insurance product other than 15 minutes or less. Or if you bundle, you'll save money. Well, duh, yeah, with any of them, if you bundle, you save money. They don't say anything about the insurance. They're selling you entertainment, name recognition, because they need your deposits, not only to cover Lynn's car accident, but you need your deposits to build up their foundational base for funding these higher risk entities out here. So, Rainforest Action Network over here. Read all about it. And if you want to get deeper into this, there's no better source out there than Ensure Our Future. Read all about it. But let's go back over here. We know that if we're dealing with any of these major insurance companies, including USAA, and we could also even put in here um, some of the others that you may not have been you know, surprised with, Geico, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, that's Warren Buffett, is one of the largest insurers of the tar sand projects up in Alberta, uh, right along with Liberty Mutual. Liberty Mutual is considered, read all about it, the dirtiest of all of them. Now, mind you, it's a mutual. It means that, that it's owned by the people that pay the premiums. We're going to be looking at mutuals down here as being a good place to go. But mutuals is not the end all. Because if Liberty Mutual is the major insurer of fossil fuel projects, then who owns Liberty Mutual? The fossil fuel projects, right? Because it's a mutual. And so you can imagine going to a, a board meeting at the annual board meeting with a resolution to get out of fossil fuels. Well, the people that are in the room voting are the fossil fuel companies. So we stand a whole lot better chance of making certain that we're fossil free if we're in one of these mutuals. So read a little bit more about it and let's talk about the alternatives. I really should turn this over to Kathy because I know Kathy has gone through this with me that um, you need to go looking to your local market. So just like we left the big banks and we went to the community banks and the community credit unions, you need to leave the commercials and go to a a regional or statewide insurance company. And the way you get there in most cases is you go through an independent insurance agent. 
And you have to be careful because they might recommend something like um, PIMCO. And PIMCO, you're going to be surprised, is not a fossil free. So uh, let's go. And uh, I've listed here right now these um, mutuals in New York. These are all relatively small. When I say relatively small, these have all been around for over 100 years. They are all well-established. They have good consumer ratings. So you want to do your research. Now, when you go to an independent insurance agent, you're going to find that they're going to get you to a good company. They're doing the screening for you. Kathy, you have a raised hand. Go ahead. So I just want to mention that I did some research um, and somebody I saw in put in the chat about Amica, and I did reach out to them, and they're a smaller, uh, more of a regional company in uh, based in Rhode Island, and um, and they were really really nice. I really liked them. I thought I was going to go with them, but I this the cost for the one policy was very high, or and combined together it was more than what I was spending already. So I said, I need to keep researching. And then I, I checked out uh, in Pennsylvania, Penn National Insurance. And I took a new homeowner's policy with them because it was a, basically the same policy, but it was so much less expensive than the Hartford is who I'm using. And they're on that list, that horrible list or list of horrible <laughs> uh, companies. Um, but I didn't go with their auto policy yet because it was again, very expensive. So I am continuing to search and I didn't know if um, Bonnie found any other uh, regional uh, insurance companies because I was speaking with Bonnie who's on here and she was researching also. So, um, so anyway, so I will tell you that Penn National is based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they actually have a whole um, section on their website about ESG, uh, like that's environmental, um, what was it? Environmental, social, social, social and governance and policies. And they give a lot of money to back to Harrisburg. And that that's not that we have Valley, but that was close enough for me. So um, anyway, I don't know if Bobby, Bonnie had anything to say. Um, yeah, I've been doing some research as well and uh, look forward to checking out the Weiss ratings at the library. I talked to uh, folks at two local um, insurance companies and I'm only looking for auto insurance. Um, so maybe I wasn't a big enough fish. I don't own my house, <laughs> but um, they gave me progressive. They were just like cheap, cheap, cheap. Here's this. And I asked about Penn National because you had mentioned it, Kathy. And um, for at least for my auto, it's a year policy. So you have to check the quotes that you get um, and make sure you're comparing. You know, I've been doing six month policies with my current insurance carrier and this was different. So it takes sorting out exactly what you're looking at, even when you're asking for apples to apples quotes, you know. Um, so it takes some time and I have not yet found um, an insurance carrier that I'm going to change to yet. So I'm still researching. Well, what we're trying to do here is out of these various groups, Kathy, Bonnie, others, is uh, get together a little team and start doing some research. And of course, report back to me because it helps me the next time I do a workshop in Pennsylvania. Uh, over the next 12 months, we're trying to put teams together in many of the states and come up with these lists. Um, uh, there's a group out in, well, I mentioned North Carolina, a group out in Washington State. I've already done something for Vermont. But um, again, Kathy did a good job with uh, Penn National. Uh, I do recommend them. Uh, and again, Bonnie, as you said, always get an apples for apples quote first and then have the conversation of over or under insurance. My partner, Joanne, and I, uh, we changed from Allstate and Travelers on two different sets of plans, and we saved 28% on the exact same coverage, and we determined that we were correctly insured, so we didn't have to make any changes. But in most cases, we're finding if you do your shopping, you can move away from the big ones and find yourself saving some money, or at least coming in even. Or maybe you were underinsured, so you're going to be fully insured where you should be at the same cost that you're paying now. 
Now you mentioned progressives and you notice that progressives is on the list. So I'm gonna use a little joke here. Uh, I'm invited to a dance and I wanna look good. So I go to my closet to get out my best shirt. And I don't have any clean shirts on my closet. So what do I, am I going to do? Well, I go to the hamper and I get the cleanest shirt in the hamper. And that's kind of what progressive is. It's not clean. It does invest in fossil fuels, but if you do your research on Ensure Our Future, you'll see that it's down on the list. It's the cleanest shirt in the hamper. Now they have another problem. They happen to be one of the major insurer uh, advertisers, major advertisers. I think they're number two on Fox News. So Flo may not be as dirty as the lizard, but she's hanging out with Tucker Carlson every night. So be careful there. <laughs> So let's, uh, again, we've got 15 minutes here to go. Let's get down here to the other share screen. And again, this is the bulk of the workshop. And perhaps sometime we'll put together another special workshop um, that just focuses on this particular issue. We do have another offering here where we spend one hour talking about one, two, three. And then we schedule a whole nother day where we come in for another hour and we just do number four. So we have the 90 minute workshop that crams the whole thing together. We have two one hour workshops. So maybe sometime down the line, you'd want to organize something around this. So let's get quick on this. This is where the big bucks are. You know, certainly banking makes a difference. Credit cards is something that's more symbolic, but meaningful. Home and auto insurance, you'd be surprised at how much of your premium dollars are going in the direction that you don't want it to go into. But here is the real money for most of us, especially retirees. So most financial institutions are complacent in this. Uh, here we are using asset managers. These are companies that people pay to manage and invest their money. Good source. Stop the Money Pipeline has this FAQ over here. It's excellent. Read all about it. It tells you about the BlackRock, the Vanguard, the State Street, the Capital Group. These uh, Capital Group has America funds. Uh, also, back over here to Green America, they have some very good material on steps to divest and reinvest and how to find fossil-free investments. But in the major workshop that we put together, we want to focus over here on as you sow. So again, what you're going to do is you're going to go to our homepage, right? You're going to click on individual divestment. You're going to go to go to workshop, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you come over here to search tool funds and elect exchange traded funds. So these are not stocks. These are mutuals and exchange traded funds, your IRA account. And it brings you to fossil free funds from As You Sow. This is a project. It's a not-for-profit. Uh, much like Mighty Deposits, this was put together in this case by financial advisors who are environmentally and climate-minded. And it is a, uh, as I said, not-for-profit. It is non-proprietary. So all the data is being fed in from SEC and other regulatory agencies. It's constantly updated day to day. The same data is fed into Bloomberg and the Morningstar. They develop their own platforms. As you so has given us this platform. So you can search funds for your 401k, your retirement plan, or your personal portfolio if you're doing your own trading. Um, because this is a quick orientation for you, I strongly recommend you go up here to menu and you see video tutorials. Spending time on an introduction is worth every second. You don't necessarily need to look at these others, but do look at an introduction. Back up here on menu, we go home. And here I'm just going to show you what this thing can do. I'm going to click on the top rated funds. So just like Mighty Deposits, where we did that one and they gave us 13 really nice banks with all the good guy buttons. Here they have sorted out what they consider to be some of the better companies based on their sustainability mandate. Now you can do all your own research on what does it mean, USSIF. This isn't exactly like B Corp, but it's kind of like B Corp. This is a vetting agency that makes certain that they have a sustainability mandate that is uh, vetted. 
So we know here that there are no investments in fossil fuels. It has a good sustainability rating. Most of these have a small carbon footprint. This is the footprint of the business itself. They're not investing in fossil banks. They're not investing in fossil insurance companies. And as we said earlier, we want to see that our, not only is our money doing no harm, moving it from doing harm to no harm, but we like it to see it doing good. And here the Clean 200 does that for us. So let's just pick right away here on this PAX fund. If we want to know what's going on with its goodness, we know that it's not doing any bad. So we get an A rating here, 0%. We know by looking at that other chart, no banks, no insurance companies. Let's go see the good they're doing. And when you scroll down here, you see that there are 10 holdings in the Clean 200. Read all about it. Here's the Clean 200. And you click here, and you can actually see what those 10 holdings are. You can see what percent. You see in total, it's 23%, but how is that all broken out? And you can see how much money is going into it. So if you hold this particular fund in your portfolio, you know that where your money is going and it's been vetted by, as you so, into the Clean 200. Really nice source of information that is almost impossible to get without spending many, many, many hours. And here it is, one click away. But again, whenever you're dealing with these funds, you want to be careful. Here, I'm sorry, I clicked too many. Let me go back. Nice to have a clean fund, but how is it performing? And here, most of your financial advisors are going to tell you that they should be performing somewhere around the 10%. If you had a fund that was based on the standard and poorest 500, now reminder, the standard and poorest 500 is the breadth of the market. It has everything in it. It has things that are really good and it has things that are really bad. So when we start to move away from funds that are based on the standard and four 500 or the Russell 2000 or the Russell 5000, we get into these funds that are managed more actively and not managed passively. The standards and poor 500 decade after decade usually runs right around 10%. So here we have this Amana growth investor that's doing far better than that. Now, most of our financial advisors will tell us not to pay attention to the three year because two and three years ago, everybody was doing good. And of course, in the past year, almost everybody has done badly unless you're in fossil fuels. If we have a moment, I'll show you just how that works. So here you have that Amana fund that we looked at performing really well. But you can see that these are actively managed funds because you're going to be paying almost 1% on your expense ratio. Now, most financial advisors will not scoff at that. Anything that's at or around 1%, this is at 9 tenths, this is almost 9 tenths, is manageable if it's performing well. You can see here is a Vert. Vert is a good company, but it doesn't have much history and it's not performing very well. You can do your own research. But just click on more funds, more funds, more funds, and it keeps on going down. And you, again, come up here and see how it's performing across the spectrum. Here, look at those Ds down here. We have a fund from Parnassus, and I am a big fan of Parnassus. Don't get me wrong here. But it is getting a B rating, not because it's in fossil fuel, but it has invested in some banks. And if you go do your research on that, click, what are those banks? Well, look, here is Bank of America. It's putting 3% of the fund into Bank of America. And so the rating goes down overall. Keep on backing over here. Where were we going on that part of the assets fund? Right here. It gets the B rating because it's investing heavily in a fossil bank. Now, that might not bother you. It has a good rating on its uh, clean energy index. Again, what you do is you go back, you look on the clean ener energy index, and you see who it's investing in. And maybe this is something you want to be doing. Let's take a real quick pick, peek at the bad guys. Because I see we got five minutes left.
Here I'm looking it up by um, fund. And you can see here that I'm getting all of their funds. Uh, if you want to toggle, you can see the Fs. Look at these, 99%. I, I was saying on performance, Look at the performance here on these fossil fuel funds, right? Wasn't doing so good 15 years ago, wasn't doing so good 10 years ago, but ever since the Russian invasion, they're rocking, making lots of money on fossil fuel. Vanguard does have some A funds. You notice that this that doesn't say USSIF, this is a check for Morningstar. But all of the other Vanguard funds have this X, meaning they don't have a sustainability mandate. Also, a lot of their so-called clean funds are real estate, health, and tech. And by their very nature, those are absent of fossil fuel, and they may be very well be high in clean 200, but you're going to see they're going to be very high in uh, Google, Alphabet, Apple, and the like. So we got four minutes left, which means very, very little time to talk about, in fact, no time to come in here and talk about um, how to find your financial advisor, how to find your asset manager, or how to find your mutual fund that is actually fossil free. You don't need to be doing business with Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock. Here are broad-based mutual funds that exclude fossil fuel companies by policy. Green Century, you may have heard of. I mentioned Parnassus earlier. Trillium, I'm very excited about Trillium. They actually produce the index fund that Green Century uses. Uh, my life partner, Joanne, she has her money with PAX. These are companies that you might want to look at rather than looking at Vanguard, State Street, BlackRock. Now, how do you get there? You often need to go talk to a financial advisor. How do you find a financial advisor? You start looking around, Amalgamated Bank, some of these other groups. Many of them are going to require a portfolio of 250 to 500,000. What do you do? You don't use these folks. You're going to have to go back over and take a good look at some of these other uh, groups. As I mentioned, oops, I went too far. Uh, when I talked about, um, here we are, Green Century. You can get this online. You don't have to have a minimum. Uh, I recommend you take a look at Green Century if you're dealing with less than $100,000, particularly for young people like my 46-year-old daughter. So here we are at 7.58, and I need to get out of this so that you folks can wrap up. I'm willing to stay around if you want to stay around. I can talk for hours on this stuff. Um, Michael, this has been great, and you certainly did give us a lot to think about. I'm just wondering at the very, in fact, the last screen you were on, you had a list of other presentations. So if we wanted to go and listen to this again, the whole 90 minute, is, is that a place where we could check? Yeah, what you want to do is, again, go back to our landing page here for the calendar workshop, and you see that I usually highlight if it's online. And like yourself, I think you would have welcomed anybody to come in and sit in on one of these, as long as they're polite. Uh, and so uh, that's the case with most of these. What I would suggest, though, is that you just write to me, and you can see here my email address is rivers.mountains at iCloud. It's right here on my name tag. So just write to me and ask for the Zoom link, and I'll send it to you. Uh, just a footnote, this 350 Colorado one, that is only going, that's a 40 minute one just on banks and credit cards. So you probably don't want to look at this. This is in preparation of the um, National Day of Action on March 21st when we're going to cut up our credit cards. But here I have one on um, an online one on February 8th with these two libraries. Um, Mountaintop Progressives, this will be a good one on February 18th. And you can see some of these others. Great. And then as a reminder, we did record this and there will be a link available that um, the library will share and the co-op will share in our newsletters and on our social media and websites.